Let's pray together. Father, um, we love you as a body. We love you. And um, Father, I thank you for this fellowship. I um, am overwhelmed, Father, by the love that's in this fellowship. Father, help us to be the men and women that you call us to be. And uh, Father, right now, I just truly ask, I truly ask that I would be completely emptied out in this moment. I thank you for the week that you gave me. And I pray, Father, that what comes out of my lips today is only from my heart. And I pray it's a testimony to you. And may you be glorified in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay. So I want you to draw your attention to Mary Fabry Martin Cuse. I was driving by this morning, and as I was on my way here, um, kind of a cool thing, I, I got up this morning to go over my slides. As I was going over my slides, you, you, there's things that you want to prompt you, and then as I was going, I noticed that the slides that were supposed to prompt me weren't there, and I would saved the wrong presentation, which I gave to Sharon, and she's here with it. I'm going, huh, I'm in trouble, right? So I'm trying to scramble and do all that stuff. I'm getting a little bit uh, anxious. And uh, Matthew said, calm down, it's okay. So um, I'm trying to get here as quickly as I can. And as I'm driving here, I'm going down Oakland Avenue, the back way. And I look over, and the Lord just makes it clear to me, notice the graveyard to your left. And as I'm driving and I'm looking at all the plots, he was showing me, even in the moment, they're done. And you still have life. You have life. This is what it's going to be about today. I want to talk to you a little bit about this young lady right here. She lived to be 82 years old. And this is what happened. I'm going to walk you through my week as a testimony. Only as a testimony. So I want you to know how this message developed. It's kind of funny in a way. Uh, two weeks ago, Pastor John spoke. Wow. Um, amazing. And what I took away from it was a lot of the purpose that we have in life. He uses Greek terminology, and he's absolutely brilliant, and we are blessed beyond measure to have Pastor John as a pastor. Amen? Then the following week, Pastor Kevin, who's pastored many churches and is, I mean, who was blown away last week with the Hebrew stuff, right? Amazing. And what I took away from that for me personally was even... Even when you're down or whatever, it's not an emotion. When you worship, we learn through the Hebraic words what it is to worship. And when everything went wrong over there last week, I was focused. I was trying to get into the service. I really was. You ever that moment? Like, I'm trying to get in it. I'm trying to get in it. You're like, I had my shaker going, come on, get started. And then Nate began to pray because they had all this stuff going on with batteries and stuff like that. And he goes, we're being tested. And in that moment, I think everybody in the spirit realized something in that moment. We're in a battle right now. And all of a sudden, the music went to a whole new level. The worship went to a whole new level. And then we learned why it went to a whole new level. So that's what we took away last week. And then these words came following that message. Ken, you have next week. <laughs> Which led to me not being able to breathe and hyperventilating. <laughs> you guys are like, oh, it's going to be a good day. Well, you know, let's go home and get something to eat and take a power nap. I was, my heart was going... I'm like, I guess I don't get to sleep for a week, right? <laughs> so I'm going down the road. We left late that evening. I'm going down the road, and I said, Lord, I need help. I had, it's not like I'm studying something right now that I can just pass on to the people. I need help. And the first image that he gave me was my Aunt Mary. It's like I saw her face, and I began to reflect on her life. I started thinking about her life. And then out of nowhere... I hear, check out the Torah portion. So I'm going down the road. I can't look it up. So I just said, this week's Torah portion. And it came up, hiya, Sarah. That's how Matthew told me how to say it, which means she lived. And so now I'm starting to put a picture together, right? You have one life to live. Ken Faber, you have one life to live. And every one of you have one life to live. So... What we're going to talk about is how we're going to live out this life. The breath that's in your lungs, right? The breath that's in my lungs. How are we going to live it out, right? 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mike Mary real fast because I want to pray your honor just for a second. So my aunt um, was a daughter, sister, wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. She was married to Love of Her Life, Dave Martin Cues, and they were actually married almost 63 years. I said that wrong. 63 years. And this is the very man that I ask for prayer for all the time. When I say my uncle Dave, I've said it for years, pray for his salvation. My Aunt Mary was a believer. And Dave had a bad experience as a young man in a fellowship, and it would throw him off course never to return. They have three sons, six grandchildren, six great-grandchildren. She was a speech therapist at the public schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so she helped kids for 25 years. It was amazing. As a matter of fact, I remember at the age of five, her sitting me on the counter going, banana, banana. That's the only reason I think I can say it to this day. So she was a professional ballerina in, the, in, in Chicago, the Chicago ba um, Ballet. She danced all the way up to the age of almost 80. She water skied, snow skied, traveled the world up to 80 until she was diagnosed with cancer. She never stopped. She um, visited six out of seven continents. One of her regrets was she never made it to Antarctica. It's a regret, okay? So I don't know what I put up there, but I can summarize her life because I know her. My Aunt Mary lived far away from me, but every time she would come into my world, and talk to my children or talk to me, all I saw was a smile. All I saw from her spirit was, Ken, there's nothing you can't do. She was the greatest encourager I've ever known. When she walked in the room, I kept thinking, oh, she's going to talk me into doing something in my life. <laughs> and she's the influence, even though she's a thousand miles away, she's the influence of me going back to college. I quit my junior year, and she kept saying, Ken, you can do it. You should go back. I'm old, Mary. Why does it matter, Ken? Just do it. Just do it. So I found myself during the claps going back to King College and graduating, and I remember wearing my little robe and getting my little uh, um, tassels. I remember walking across and, and graduating, and I remember in my heart thinking about her because I know she was an influence behind me to finish. I never used my degree. I'm still a real estate guy. Nothing changed. But she encouraged me to finish what I started. Great encourager. So I want to lend it, leave it there, and, and I wanted to say this. My aunt did not just talk about taking risk. My aunt did it. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Think about that. So... There's this, this thing you're supposed to turn yourself on when you get here, and uh, I didn't do it. So I wanted you to hear that because I just summarized 82 years of a person's life, right? And you're sitting here right now with breath in your lungs, and your story is being written before you. And Matthew's been challenging everybody lately, if you're listening. If the book was written today, would you be in the crowd or would they be writing about you? been thinking about that. You've been thinking about it? Yeah. All right. So there was a survey taken of 50 people over the age of 95, 95, and they were all um, of right mind. I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> I want you to say, we got, we got 50 crazy 95-year-olds year old, that are losing their mind. No, they, they were in their right mind. And they said, if you had to do life all over again, what would you do different? Now, you can just look at that right there and think, well, whatever. Or you could say, wow, we should be gleaning from this. So one of the things was is that I would spend more time with my family and show them more love. One was I would reflect more and live in the moment. I would take more risk and not have fear. And I would do more things that would live beyond me. Wow. How cool is that? Have you thought about that in your life? Or are you just doing life? So I know for me personally, I worked in a factory. And when I was um, my kid, I remember Ryan was graduating from, from kindergarten. 
And I wanted to go and I only had three sick days and I had already burned them all up because I got the flu shot and I got sick the next day and for three days I was laying in bed. I used all three sick days at one time. He graduates, he said, you can't go. I remember sitting in the plant um, in the back crying by myself, going, Lord, I am not gonna miss my kids' activities, please. I never dreamed from that I would become a real estate developer, ever. Man, he's big. So, reflect more and live more in the moment. So I just want to give you a, a thought. So, maybe some of you were there that day, but five drummers, boom, 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 boom. And I had just sat up from the seat, and I can't remember who took my spot. Somebody had just taken my spot, Pastor Tom. Pastor Tom had come, and the, the men are playing. And what I want to do more than anything was to dance while the drum was being played. But this was a problem. I, had, I hadn't been home in like five or six weeks. I'd been sleeping on a mattress on the floor and my sciatic nerve got real bad and I couldn't hardly walk. So I was walking and I had this limp, but I wanted to dance. I'd heard that when you dance around the fire, you put your heart closest to the fire. You ever heard this, right? You put your chest this side and you dance around the fire. It's like a picture of the Holy Spirit and your heart is close to, to the Spirit of God. And so the music began, and I was too tired, and my leg was literally numb, and I was like, but I've been waiting for this moment to dance. And I remember in my mind reasoning, I don't get this moment back. Either I get up, even though I'm, I'm hurting, and dance and celebrate, or I sit there and I miss the moment, right? And I don't get to talk about it either. So this is what happened. I was dancing. I was singing. And here's the other thing. Whoever led us that day, she said, you know what this means when you're doing this? And you see Indians go, hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know what it meant. She said, it's a dance, like a war dance. You're stamping out the enemy. So I found myself just, just stamping as hard as I could with a leg I couldn't feel. And I'm like, yes, yes. And I remember seeing a few of our people. It's 10 in the morning. It's hot. We didn't sleep good. We're tired. We're wore out. I remember yelling out, you'll never get this moment back. You'll never get it back. It's now. And I remember watching one by one by one get out of their chair and start to dance. Isn't that cool? They didn't miss the moment. So reflecting on life um, how often do you stop so down and just reflect? We get so caught up in uh, perhaps maybe in our life the, uh, the thing that is burdening us at the time. And the reason I just use David because everyone knows the story, right? David comes back, his family's gone, his wife's gone, his wives are gone, and he begins to weep and his men want to kill him, right? And what does he do? He encourages himself in the Lord. So, I want to say this to you, and we're not even in the message, by the way. I'm just trying to build a foundation for you. Not even close to it. I'm sorry. Um, I want you to build this up in yourself, that you have to know that in your life, that God has already done miracles in your life. And even if you're in a place of a holding pattern that feels like it's not going anywhere, you have to constantly remind yourself to remember Remember, remember. And if you don't believe me, look at through all of what Israel is doing. They're stacking stones all over the country so they would remember. This is where we crossed. This is why we did this. This is why we built the altar here. Why? Because we forget. So you need to reflect more in your life. Take time, step back and go, whew, I'm in it right now. But I remember this in my life. I remember when you were here. I remember when you did this. And that's personal, right? Cool. Okay, take risk. Now, I want to say this because I talked to some of you this week, and uh, I just want to give you a, a testimony real fast. Taking risk in life. What in the heck are you people afraid of? Seriously. I just want to be real with you. What are you truly afraid of? Every time some challenge comes up, really, what is the first thing that comes to your heart? It's fear. There's no question. You look at your bank account and go, oh, no, I don't know. i got to check that out a little bit more. I'm not saying that you don't use wisdom. But I'm saying if God is in it, 
and you know God's in it, what in the world are you afraid of? You go for it. You'll never see his mighty hand without it. So when I'm working in a factory, y'all, most of you know the story, but I worked in a factory and every day I'd get off work and I'd go look at real estate. Every day. Sharon could never find me. Where were you? I was, I was sniffing lumber, I, you know, in a, in a house. I mean, I walk into a construction site going, gosh, I just love the smell of this place. And I'd walk around and go, hey, so what do we got here, boys? And they're looking at me like, who are you? I just, I mean, seriously, I mean, I came from the factory. I didn't look like a businessman. I had shredded jeans on and dirty tennis shoes. And I'd be walking through there going, I like what you're doing here. And they're like, okay. I said, can I look around? Yeah, so where are your plans? And I'd roll out the plans and I'd study their plans. I'm not buying it. I have no money. And I'm not surely I'm going to build anything. But what I didn't realize in that moment was God was putting something inside of me that was from him. And it was why we always say this question. If you're going to take a risk, do you love it? And if you love it, there's no risk. There's no risk when you love something. But you know why? Because you're doing what you love. I know that's like people say that all the time, but I'm telling you as a testimony, I loved real estate. Still do. You know why? I get to meet people. I get to share the gospel. I get to help people, right? So if you're battling with that in this room, quit being afraid. The living God wants to show you how awesome he is. Amen. Amen. Another little story. We're in Africa. We land. They gather us around. Do not, I repeat, do not get any water in Africa. I'm thinking, note to myself, do not get in any water. Got it. No water. Got it. Stay away from water. Don't drink it. Don't get in it. Don't get near it. It's infested. Plus, there could be some crazy creatures in there. So we go into a place called Tukumasasa. First 16 Christians baptized in the village. They walk up to me. They go, we have called you Ken the Baptist. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like well, that is really cool. Thanks. <laughs> And we would like for you to baptize us. <laughs> Me? Yes. You and two other pastors, we would like for you to go. I'm like, what an honor. So um, I put on some shorts. They, they put me in this little thatched roof, small house. Um, that's a whole other story, but we're walking through. And we're going through sugar cane. And just picture this red, red, red dirt. Okay? Red dirt. And as we're going through it, um, I um, realized that we are heading to a bottle of water. And I went, oh no. <laughs> and it's this flowing thing like this. I mean, it's right in the middle of a field, and I'm going, well, that is the nastiest looking water I've ever seen in my life. And I need to preface it by this. The night before I got, they tell you to sleep with these nets over you. I'm like, we're in a building, who needs a net? I woke up. My elbow was like the size of my kneecap. It was like out to here. I mean, it's huge. I'm walking around anyway like this. Like. So I'm walking. I see that and I go, oh, this isn't good for me. Right? I'm already in pain. I'm already swollen. Right? So this 14-year-old, the pastor literally does this. He pushes the 14-year-old kid in the water. He just pushes him in off the bank. Kid's walking along the water trying to find a deep spot. And I, and I remember saying, Lord... Be with me. I'm not afraid of this water. And we get to a place, and it's about this child. I walk in. As soon as I stepped in, I sank that deep in the mud. And we began to baptize the first Christians in the village. And I really had no fear. I didn't care about what would happen. But I'll never forget this moment. As I was coming out, and they literally had to pull me out of the mud, one of the ladies that was with us said, Ken, look at your elbow. And I looked down, and the elbow was completely healed. And I remember her saying, Every time you dipped in the water, I watched it. Baptism. No fear. Isn't that cool? I'm telling you to take risk. I'm telling you not to have fear. I'm telling you to jump in the water when it's muddy. When everyone else tells you not to do it, you do it. You go for it. Right? My daughter, Caitlin. Um, this is one of the coolest risks of all time. She calls me. Uh, about uh, two months ago, two months ago, and she says to me, hey, Dad, um, I had a dream. In my dream, I'm coming home. I said, really? And she goes, yeah, and I'm buying the old house on Shady Brook Drive where I grew up. I went, really? And she goes, yeah, it's for sale. And I'm like, okay, Kat, um, you work in 
Raleigh, North Carolina. So does your husband. I'm just logically thinking. And um, I don't know that that's a good move. Right? She goes, this is what I believe, Dad. I believe that God has called me home. And so we're going to take the chance and we're going to buy it and we're going to rent it out. And when God says, come home, I'm coming home. Amen. She goes, but I want the house I grew up in. I said, okay, little girl. So we get it, right? I had no idea what God was doing. Here's the coolest part of that whole story. Coolest part. Bradley's been trying to get here for almost two years, 18 months, something like that. The day after they signed the contract, in faith, the next morning he goes online to look for his company, Smith & Nephew. They posted his job, lateral move, with the upgrade that he always wanted. He was in uh, trauma. He wanted to do a different type of medicine. It was posted 18 hours later. 18 hours later, it's posted. He applies for it. He's living here today in that house. Amen? These testimonies are not about anything other than God himself. I'm trying to encourage you about taking a risk in your life. I'm also going to share with you that they don't always work out quite the way you have planned. Do more things that live beyond you. I want you to direct your attention, if you can see it, her name is Dolores Parker. Dolores Parker used to be at Avoca Christian Church where I attended for 18 years. Dolores Parker was a phenomenal lady. I didn't truly know her like everyone else did. She had already hit the mission fields by the time I started. She was, uh, I, I don't know the term, I'm not allowed to say the term because I mess up medical things, but she, she basically looked at um, when somebody was really sick, had a bacteria, she would look at it and then give it to the doctors and the doctors would know exactly how to um, treat the sickness. I don't know what they call it, but apparently she is one of the best in this region. And when she walked in one day and told all the doctors, I'm heading to Haiti, God has called me. They were rattled. And so she goes to Haiti to devote her life to sickness and disease. And she fell in love with the children of Haiti. And she was over there for a while, and because she worked in surgery and trauma and dealt with blood, she got HIV. Nobody at that time even knew what HIV was. And we were all scared of it. Remember that day you, you heard about it? You're like, what is that? And then all of a sudden, you don't even want to be around anybody that you think has it. Because you don't even know, like, is that from saliva? What is that? So she comes back dying. And nobody will have anything to do with her. She's dying basically alone in her house, writing letters back to the people of Haiti, telling them how much she loves them. That she prays that they'll press on and seek the face of the living God. And then this lady, Susie Lahr, who also attends Avoca, has a heart for mission, and also at the same level, brilliant woman. She goes to care for her because nobody else will. <clears throat> Nobody else will. Susie's heart is just like that. She's not afraid of sickness and disease. She serves a living God. So she goes to Dolores' side, and she's going to be the last one and probably the only one that stays with Dolores. And on her deathbed, Dolores says to Susie, the children are waiting on you, Susie. And Susie goes, okay, because she deals with death on a regular basis. And she just comforts her. Dolores dies. <clears throat> Susie is invited to go on a mission trip to Haiti. And uh, she goes over there to close out Dolores' things and to make sure that everything's in order. As soon as she walks out onto the mission field and she goes to the camp, a pastor walks up and says these words to Susie Dar. The children are waiting for you. And her spirit rose up. And she said, Lord, I'll serve you Amen. with all that's within me. There's, um, Susie personally is responsible for three schools and three major orphanages and churches. And there's 20 under their care. Dolores is gone. We could have drove by her grave today. But her legacy and her mark lives on. And Susie's told me, she says, Ken, I'm going to push. There's nothing left in me. And I'm looking 
for the next person that will say, who will go? The children are waiting. Okay, we're about to get into the teaching. So this is a thing that happened with my kids. Anyone here ever play sports? Really? One, Paige, me and Paige, we throw a ball all the time. And I know that's why me and you, Paige, on that, okay. So anyway, my kids uh, all played sports and they played baseball. One of the sports they played was baseball. And they could go three for four, and Brent isn't here, but he would testify to this. We'd get in the car, I was a coach. I'd say, did three for four tonight, buddy? He goes, yep. He's proud, he's like, yeah, three for four, did good, Dad. I would only focus on the one at bat that he screwed up on, every time. He goes, why are you doing that? Let's focus on the three that I did good, Dad. I said, let's focus on the one that you didn't do good. I already know you got on base, I already know you scored. You know that. Let's focus on what you didn't do right. Then I thought about it and went, you know what, I do beat that kid up too much, both of them, actually all four of them. So the other day when I was preparing this thought, I don't have a message by the way at this point, I'm nervous. God showed me my aunt, he showed me you have one life to live, and then all of a sudden, I'm in the shower and I'm praying, it hits Tuesday, and I'm going, Lord, I don't know where I'm going with this. And this is cool. Y'all are gonna like this. First, I gotta use my Hebrew word before I go any further. Do y'all know this Hebrew word? Gemalut? Hasidim? Okay. It means the giving of living kindness. Now, we're gonna focus on this and another word for the rest of the message. Because I wanted to build up to you have one life to live and then I want to build around this, and then I hope that it gets inside of you. Okay? Hallelujah. So this literally means the giving of loving kindness is a core value in everybody's uh, everyday life in, uh, for the Jews. It requires that an individual give complete, gimelut hasidim, which is loving kindness, without the anticipation of receiving anything in return. Okay? So, I don't know this word yet. I just want you to get this. I don't know this word yet. Hadn't seen it. Don't even know anything about it. But I was taking a shower, and all of a sudden, I got this. This is so cool. This is for every one of you. I mean, I'm like, I literally, in my spirit, I'm sitting there, and I hear, say thank you for this. Say thank you. I'm like, okay. So, I'm going to read Gimelit, right, Hasidim, to you. Now listen, when you hear this in your ear and in your heart, it's for you. Some of these things you've done once. Some of these things you've done five times. Some of these things maybe you've done almost all of them. But this is a moment, I just want to say, from the leadership, but it was from God. I'm telling you, I don't know this word. I just know to write it all down. So receive this. If you're not on the list, get on the list. Okay? And if you lack being on the list that much, work at it. Thank you for caring for the needs of the widows. Thank you for all night prayer meetings. Thank you for praying for Israel and our nation and our fellowship. Thank you for cleaning the restrooms. Thank you for preparing ogne meals. Thank you for mowing the lawn, for cleaning the building, for visiting the sick, for donating to ministries and the bus, coming early every week for worship practice on the Sabbath and practice on Thursday nights. Thank you for helping others move, even across country, helping others in their homes with repairs. Thank you for the hours committed to feast days, plays, and productions, helping with the media, countless hours of studying and teaching, articles written, long hours of dance practice and flags, repairs at the fellowship, those who drove to Knoxville to pray with Coop, small group meetings, giving gifts to one another, sowing into missions, sharing the gospel on the streets, opening your homes to a guest, organizing events, 
teaching the children, tithing, giving offerings, visiting others just for fellowship, impacting communities, discipling others, inviting guests to the fellowship, those who keep the guard during our services, greeting everyone with a smile, and my personal favorite, making coffee. <laughs> Those are all basically acts of service. Gimelud Hasidim. Right? It can be either money or it can be a service. So I want to say thank you. If you're doing those things, thank you. If you're not doing those things, it's required of you. Sadaka. It means righteousness. Alm giving or charity. Righteousness. This is what we're going to focus on for the rest of this. And we're going to connect something that changed me this week. So I'm excited. And hopefully I'm going to drop the mic here in a minute. Because I'd just rather it just come from my heart and not just what words on the page. Okay? Because I actually lived this out. I'm just going to read it so it kind of flows. But the truth is... I actually have experienced it. So um, the word literally means just, justice or righteousness, but commonly used as charity. Notably, this concept of charity is different from the modern Western understanding of charity, which is typically understood as a spontaneous act of goodwill and a marker of generosity. Um, as Sadadak is rather an ethical obligation. In Judaism, uh, Sadadak Sadeka refers to religious obligations to do what is right and just, which Judaism emphasizes as an important part of living a spiritual life. Um, it's a spiritual obligation that must be performed regardless of one's financial standing and is considered mandatory even for those limited with limited financial means. So this this is um, doesn't matter what level you are. When you go into the temple, right, you would always give, whether you're rich or poor, everyone gave the same, right? So here's what I want to uh, build about, and then we'll, we'll cruise. So what is righteousness, right? Right? This is what is righteousness. This is the attribute of God. This righteousness is an attribute of God. For your, your Yahweh, your Elohim, is the Elohim of Elohims, and he is the master of masters, the great, the mighty, the fearful Elohim, who does not lift up faces, nor does he take a bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien to give him food and clothing. This is the heart of the father, right? The heart of the father is that he loves the alien, the fatherless, the widow, gives him food and clothing. This is an attribute of God, right? It's righteousness. So here is the coolest part of righteousness that I just, boom, get excited about. Get ready to get excited. I know you're like, where are you going with this? I want you to get it here in just a second, okay? If there is any among you, this is Deuteronomy 15, 7. Get ready to mark it in your Bible because I want you to remember it forever and ever. Amen. If there is any among you, poor man, one of a kinsman in any of the towns of your land, which is the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your mind and your heart and close your hand to the poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide uh, to him, and you shall surely lend him um, sufficient for his need, which he lacks. Beware, lest there may be a base thought in your mind or a doubt in your heart and say, the seventh year or the year of release is at hand and your eye be evil against your poor brother. And you give them nothing and he cry out to the Lord against you and it be sin to you. Now, I highlighted this. Check this out. Are you ready? You shall, this is a commandment. Get this. We're always talking about commandments in here. It's a commandment. This is not, well, I don't know if I want to do this. You shall give to him freely without begrudging it. Because for the Lord, because for this, the Lord will bless you in all your work and all you undertake. For the poor will never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to your needy, and to your poor in your land. So here's the cool part. Okay. Um, 
I want to make sure I don't um, do one more thing. Okay. So if you want to connect a few verses to Deuteronomy 15 about how God repays you. He who is gracious to the poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. A woman of valor is a woman who extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hand to the needy. So, when I lived in Shady Brook, the house that we once had, the one that Caitlin just bought, y'all heard my testimony. That was the very place I remember where I was standing. I remember talking to God, saying, what is truth and what is righteousness? You know what I thought righteousness was this whole time? I mean, literally, you know what I thought righteousness was? I actually thought it was how I acted before God. I'm like, oh, I'll try to be holy. I'm going to guard my eyes or guard my ears. I'm not going to watch this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to eat this. Found out I wasn't even near the mark. Righteousness isn't about this move, what, this way with God. It's actually this way with man. And I'm just now learning it. It's always been a part of who I am. And see if this makes sense to you, that righteousness is tied to how you care for those. Because here's a verse you always quote, quote, but this is important. Check this out. I'm going to link righteousness right now to Deuteronomy 15 that gives you the blessing. But what is righteousness? It's the acts that you do to man. Matthew 25 says this. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in and naked and you clothe me? And then did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of these, you've done it unto me. Now, is that pretty awesome? That there's a direct correlation. How you care for others is considered righteousness upon yourself. You know what the rabbis teach? I mean, I'm so stoked on this. I could drop this right now and just go. But I want you to get this. You guys know me, right? Everyone knows me. And uh, there was a season in my life um, um, that uh, I, I was in business and doing very, very, very well. And then 2008 and 2010 came, and I got a few things in my life out of order. And this is what I did with life. I need, people needed help. People still needed help. And um, I did this with my money, what, what I had. And... Um, I said, um, they're like, can we need help? And I'm like, Psh, I can't even help me anymore. I certainly can't be helping you, brother. Right? That was my heart. I wasn't speaking it. That was just my heart. How can I help you? I'm hanging on to everything I have. I thought I had faith, and God clearly spoke this in my ear. Ken, you don't have faith. You have faith in what I gave you, and you've used that as faith, as a crutch, as faith. That's not faith. So I took what he gave me, and I squeezed as tight as I could. You know what he did? He ripped it out of my hands. Ripped it. It's gone. I stood there like this going, is there anything in there? And I found myself in a really upside down situation. So, um, I thought, putting this together this week, my kids used to do this all the time. i give them money. They'd come in. Um, Dad, can I have five dollars? I said, I gave you five dollars this morning, or I gave it to you last night. How do you not have five dollars? Well, Dad, I was at school and there was a kid hungry, and I gave him my money. And I would go, I'm proud of you. Here's five bucks, and sometimes a little more. And I got a glimpse just then, in that moment, just a glimpse what your Heavenly Father does for you. You want to hang on to it? You want to squeeze it? Your hand is like this? And you're supposed to be righteous? This is not righteousness. It's not righteousness. This is righteousness. Righteousness that says it's all yours. I have no ownership in anything. It's yours. Take it freely. Give it freely. Take it freely. Give it freely. That's righteousness. Your Messiah walked it out every day. You know what the rabbis teach is this. The rabbis say it's a greater honor 
When a poor person receives the gift, it's honor to you because now God can bless you that gave the gift. So the poor man receiving the gift is actually bestowing a greater honor upon you by receiving the gift than you gave to him. And yet we want to hang on to it and then act like we're righteous, but the righteousness truly is surrender. It's this. I got it this week. I understood what it was for the first time in a long time what God was speaking to me my whole life since I was a little boy. I didn't understand it until my daughter came home and bought a house and I'm ripping out all the boards that I put in 20 years ago and as I'm ripping out a board, God would speak, I'm restoring it. I put a new board in, I'm restoring all things. I'm like, what does that mean, Lord? I love this house. This is where you spoke to me, Lord. Speak to me again. And he was. He was showing me. He goes, Ken, you remember the night you asked, what is righteousness? I'm trying to show you. I want to share it with you. Let's get some more confirmation using the scripture. Acts 10, 3 and 4. About the ninth hour of the day, we saw clearly in a vision of an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Whoa! What's an alm? That's right. The gift that you've given to the poor and the needy, Cornelius, you fear God, you pray, but God sees it as a memorial that you take care of you, those that are around you in need. Right? We do a great job of taking care of one another. But Jesus says, let me show you who your neighbor is. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is not sitting here. This is your brother. But who is your neighbor? Right? I know. I know. Roll mound. You're working on it. I know you're working. But I want you to get excited, all of you, to get excited about this. I want you to look for opportunities. I can tell you as a personal witness that when I stopped in 2010 and said, Lord, I surrender, it did not get easy. But man, did it get sweeter. So I wanted to share this little one more. See if this rings a bell with you. Acts 9, 39 through 41. This will be the second witness for this. And rising up, Simon Peter went with them. And having arrived, they led him up to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him. And they were weeping and showing the coats and the garments that Tabitha made while she was alive. I want to stop for just one second. When you read it in certain scriptures, it says that she, bared, she gave alms. So picture this scene. A wed this Tabitha dies. And they go and get Peter. And Peter's walking. And they get there, and they're in the upper room. And all these women are holding the garments, and they say these words to Peter. Look what she did for us. She's the one that fed us. She is the one that gave us something to drink. And if she is the one that clothed us with her own hands, oh, how we miss her. And what does Peter do? Leave the room. He prays. This is cool. And he presents her alive. What is righteousness? You remember in Matthew 25, the righteous are the ones that feed, clothe, Right? Give a drink, visit the prison. That's righteousness. What happened to those that were not righteous? Where'd they go? They were separated that day to the left. This righteous person, they cry out. The widows cry out. Fed, clothed, gave us drink, cared for us. She's righteous. And Peter says, you live. By the Spirit of God, get up and live. And that's the message for you guys. This is the message that when you take care of the needy and those around you, it's righteous before God. Just like I was a dad that said, oh my goodness, you gave away all you had? Yeah. Do you think my kids suffer? I can tell you right now they don't. As a dad who spoils their kids, they don't suffer. 
$5, believe me, they did better than $5. My heart bursts when they tell me stuff like that. How much more does your Heavenly Father heart burst when you look to those in need and you say, their need is greater than my need. And I used to have an attitude. This was my attitude. Sharon used to say it to me all the time, why do you do that? And I used to say to Sharon, I trust him so much. I don't know if their trust is as strong as mine, but if I give him what I have, he'll give it back to me. They may not get it. I will. I really believe that with all my heart. I really believe that I had $100 and they need $100. I gave them $100. I'm like, ah, oh, you get $100. I may, I know I'm getting it back. I believed it with all my heart. 2010, I went, boom. And guess what happened to me? My world dried up. It dried up. And he slowly started prying my hands open, slowly. He says, now, Ken, do I get it all? Yes, God, you get it all. So I want to boast on him for just a second. This is exciting. My wife designed a home in 2008 that we built. It was the house that she loved. Everything in it, every square inch, she walked through. She designed it. She, had the, she met with the architects. I want this here, I want this here, I want this here, I want this, I want this, I want this. It was amazing. It was huge. We got in it and we go, wow, you built a big house, huh? 2009 came, 2010, my life is out of balance. Boom. And she says to me, it's just a house. All I need is you. I don't need a house, Ken. And we graciously sold our home, moved into an apartment, and I overlooked, in the apartment I lived in, I overlooked my house on Shady Brook Drive. <laughs> I'm literally in an apartment like this going, are you kidding me right now, Lord? <laughs> That's the house I left. And I'm looking at it right now. In 2018, I'd be remodeling it. Cool, right? But it gets better. Maybe some of you guys struggle with this, but I want to encourage you today. Because I'm encouraged. You be encouraged. So all this time goes by. Eight years go by. And she's never once mentioned to me about her home. Not one time has she ever said, I miss that house. Not once. I was broken as a man because I felt like I would messed up. I felt like I was so out of balance that I couldn't hang on to it. And I let her down. I couldn't live with it, actually. It stirred in me all the time, off and on. God gave us a beautiful home where we live. It's a beautiful mountain view, and I love it. So one day, a while back, Sharon and I were driving, and we look up, and there's this house sitting on a hill, and I was given a Hebrew name. And that name actually means a couple of things, but one of the names it means one that occupies a hill. And so I always told Sharon, I said, if God ever takes me in front of this place, girl, it's going to be on a hill. It was a joke, but I meant it. <laughs> And we're driving one day, and I look up, and there's this house, and we made a left on it. And I said, I love that house. She goes, I do too. I said, it's a really nice house. I said, hmm, maybe one day that thing ever comes available. Sharon looks at houses all the time. I mean, she should, she's better a real estate agent than I am. Oh, goodness. It's okay. Everyone remain calm. <laughs> I want you to have fun with this, but I want you to get it in your spirit. She tells me. Ken, you remember that house we looked at? I said, yeah, it's for sale. I said, get out of here. She goes, can we go look at it? I went, oh, that ain't good. <laughs> I said, sure, baby, we can go look at it. So I get there early. I'm covered in, um, I'm covered in paint, caulk, sawdust. I've been working every day at my daughter's house and loving every minute of it. So I walk up, and this is me, and the realtor opens the door, and this is what they see. Paint, sawdust, and I'm white because I, I was doing this with sheetrock. And they weren't expecting me, let's just say that. And they go, hello? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't expecting me to buy that house. I can just stay there right now. It's pretty funny. And as soon as I walked up to the door, though, as soon as I walked up to the door, I put my foot on the sidewalk, and I said, it's our old doors, Lord. Same door as we had at our old house. And I stepped inside the door, and I looked down at the floor. And when we lived at our old house, we had put this dark wood in. 
And after we put it in, we go, that's beautiful. And then the second day we go, we've made a huge mistake. <laughs> every footprint, every dog print showed, right? And I always told Sharon, I said, boy, if I ever did this again, we'd, build, we'd have big oak floors that you couldn't see dirt. So when she opens the door and I stepped in, I looked at the floors and they were the same oak floor that I envisioned. I went, man. And I'm looking at this lady who can't figure me out. I said, God is speaking in this moment. And she goes, really? And I said, yes. And she shares a testimony of her son, very sick. And um, she says, I don't usually talk like this, but I was talking about God. So it opened her up and she said, I heard in my ear that my son was healed and I, we don't talk that way. And she said, I went to my friend in Nashville, he was a doctor and said, I believe my son's been healed. And he said, stay on the medicine one more week. It's cool if God really spoke that to you. He's supposed to stay on it for years. They waited one week and they did the test and he was healed. So I had this moment with the real estate agent. She's walking around as I'm walking around, I'm noticing all the things that Sharon said, oh, if I had to do over again, it would look like this. And I'm looking, I'm going, oh my goodness. So we look at the house, we leave. We go back to the house. And I said, Lord, I gotta know it's from you. So we're walking around and Sharon and I drive two separate ways, two separate ways we drive up, or two separate cars. And I'm praying. And Sharon's praying. And as she's praying, I don't want you ever have this heart, ever. I'm going to speak it like a, from my heart. She said, as she was driving, she said, Lord, this is too nice for me. I'm not worthy of anything like this. And we sometimes think to ourselves, I'm not worthy of receiving a gift from my Heavenly Father. Oh, I have to stay down here because if I receive this gift, I'm not, it's not good. And you take guilt, the spirit of guilt on. And I'm falling behind her. I'm like, Lord, you've got to give me a word today. So as we're walking down the sidewalk, Sharon hears these words. Your home. And she starts to cry. So when I meet her in the sidewalk, she's hugging me. I'm pointing to the gutters going, that's got to be fixed. <laughs> we walk in the house. And I said, Lord, I got to hear from you. I went into four rooms. And four rooms had four verses. And every verse spoke right in my heart. Every one of them. And I began to weep when I got to the third room. And I took on the same thing that she did. Lord, I'm not worthy of this. And um, he then began to say, this is the message that I've given you. The message that he gave me was this, I will repay, I will restore, I will restore all things that you've lost. I lost it. I began to open my hand to everything around me and God began to repay. And he says, Ken, I've restored your family. I'm restoring your homes. I'm bringing your family back. And I said, well, take it. Oh, I want you to be encouraged by this. All right. The other day, there was a man in need and he came to our fellowship. I was overwhelmed by this in my spirit because I already knew what God was showing me, the righteous acts, the way that people give in this fellowship, the way they love, the what, you know, right, literally righteous acts. What did Jesus say? He said, uh, I blotted out all your sins and then, then you, you were, you were uh, embedded, you, you got his righteousness. What, did, what does that mean, you got his righteousness? All the acts of the living God were bestowed upon you. And this is what he says to all of you and to me. Now go keep doing what I did. Amen. What did I do? I healed. I saw a need. I fixed it. I did it. I did what I saw the Father do. What does the Father say? The Father says, when you see the needy, when you see the poor, when you see the sick, when you see the orphan, you see the widow, give of yourself. It's cool, isn't it? He restores. He builds you up. He gives back. He's the best dad. Dad, I gave away my $5. Are you? Why? Because someone had a need. Woo! No hesitation. It wasn't like, oh, Dad, I got a pair of high heel shoes. Now I need $10. No. I saw a need, Dad. 
And that's what he says to all of us. Be open to the needs around you. He's saying, I will bless you. That's the promise in Deuteronomy 15. He says, I will bless you. So when this man came in the other day and he says, I have a need. I have a need. This place began one by one. Certain people walked up. Some hand checks, some handed cash. Some said, I'll bring you what I have in my own home. I'll give you all that I have. And I kept thinking myself, I'm like, Lord, they're doing righteous acts right now. Maybe they're even unaware of it. And one girl, one girl, who I don't want to mention names, but I just got so moved this whole week. She pulls out her checkbook, and I'm talking to her. And she says these words, I'm afraid. I am started getting blessed, and I'm afraid. And she goes, I just don't know what to do. Right? And she has her checkbook in her hand. And the reason she got her checkbook out was because she was getting ready to make a gift to someone in tremendous need. And I kept thinking my whole... I never said it. I was just thinking it. It's in your left hand right now. It's right there. It's a checkbook. When you write the check, your heavenly father looks down and says, Man, I am pleased with you. I'm not ripping anything out of your hands. He doesn't say, give, and I'll rip something else out of your hands. He says, give, and I will repay. Amen. That's what he says. Do you believe it? Yeah. The reason I say this with such passion, and the reason I can say it with this much passion, I lived it. I went eight years without it. Eight years. Anyone know what that means in Hebrew? <laughs> yeah, it's new beginnings. New beginnings. My life is a new beginning. I'm restored with my wife. I'm getting restored with my children. And I look around this room. And I can look at certain faces. And I know that God is restoring you too. Amen? I didn't mean to go like that. So I want to tell you this, and this is it, and I close. Raise your hand and be honest. How many knew that we had a school slash orphanage in Africa. Okay, not some, but not many. Okay. So here we have an opportunity. They teach the Sabbath. They teach the feast days. They're an orphanage and they're a school. They changed their name after we went to Africa and they met Matthew and he started to teach. And he says, I know this to be a truth. And I'm going to change everything and start following in that way. I, I'm going to do it. So he did it. And then we said, we've got to find out if that's real, if he's just you know, looking for some cash. So we sent somebody, and they intermingled with him for three days. And he writes back, it's the real deal, baby. It's the real deal. And we, as a fellowship, purchased shoes for the children of that orphanage. But we could be doing more. This is someone who's named after us. They're literally a branch of who we are, but yet we don't even know it. He says widows and orphans first, then poor. And guess what? Uh, they got two out of the three. Seriously, they are poor and they're orphans. I'm speaking to me right now. I'm not just talking to you. I'm just saying, I'm not telling you to. I'd please get this in your spirit. I'm not saying give it away so you can get it. That is so wrong. And it's so, ugh, I want to vomit with that thought. What I'm trying to say is, don't be afraid. Amen. It means don't be afraid. Take the risk. You are not going to starve. That's all I'm saying. Does that make sense? So we're going to do something. A little challenge today. This is what the leadership said today. They said, whatever you collect today, the vineyard will match today. So we're going to take up an offering for this orphanage. Whatever's collected, we'll double it. The, or, the, uh, the body, uh, the, 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 the fellowship will. Why? Because we're trying to get more involved in missions. We want the living God to know we're not about just us. It's not about just us. It's not about just, hey, how are we going to survive when things go down? How are we going to get along with each other? You know, are we going to share our beanie weenies? Seriously. What are you doing right now today? Today. Okay? So, when you finish something, you're supposed to say these words. Let's close in prayer. And I'll pray, and then we can um, collect. Okay? 
And I, I want you to be encouraged. Uh, did you ever connect righteousness with the acts of your giving? Me neither. But yet you see it in, in Matthew 25 so clearly, don't you? And you see it with the widow. And you see it with Cornelius. I never saw it before. And those of you that are doing it, I bet I passed the mic around. You would testify to that. I know you would. Because he's impacted your life that way. Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for the blood of Yeshua. I thank you, Father, that he is righteous. I thank you that he made the example. Father, stir in us today to be aware of those needs that are around us, Father. Help us to open our hands. Help us, Father, to see the needs of others greater than ourselves. Thank you, Father, um, that you've blessed us beyond measure, that we are so rich in your sight. So help us, Father, to have the right hearts towards you. We bless you today, Father. We love you. Thank you for your Sabbath. Amen. <laughs>